Hello everyone, welcome to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, coming to you from the podcast studio today. And we're gonna be talking about five of the biggest myths around differential pairs and designing differential pairs. Now, if you see me on LinkedIn, you know that I'm pretty active addressing some of these issues with understanding of differential pairs. And what I'm gonna do in this video is outline the five most common mistakes or misconceptions that I see surrounding differential pairs. And we're gonna look at some examples in Altium. So make sure to hop into your copy of Altium Designer and follow along and let's get started. Myth number one, differential pairs must be routed close to each other in order for the interface to function. And this is sometimes called tight coupling. This is one of the worst design rules I've ever heard simply because it's so ambiguous. There actually is no definition for what constitutes tight coupling. So what really matters in differential pairs is that the signal that I send in on the positive side and the signal that I send in on the negative side both arrive at the receiver within some time window. Let's take a look at what this looks like on a PCB. So here on screen, I am looking at the bottom side of a board with an FPGA. We have a differential pair routing out of these two pins coming out of the FPGA. This is a DDR4 reference clock, and you can see it is a differential pair based on the naming. Now, all that really matters with this line is that the two traces are routed such that whatever signals are sent on both sides arrive at these two vias and then later at this receiver over here at the same place at the same time. So really what matters is the amount of time required for each signal to be routed along this interconnect and not necessarily whether or not these two pairs are closer together. And in fact, what I could do is if I wanted, I could take this section of trace and I could move this up to the top layer. And then if I re-pour the polygons, we'll then see that all of this is going to fill in and we could still have a functioning interface. So we could have this trace on the bottom layer and then we could have this other trace up here on the top layer. Of course, we would wanna remove this intersecting trace, but you get the idea. So what is one reason that we put these two traces possibly close together like this. You can actually see here on this particular line that these two traces really aren't that close together. If I look at the distance between them, it's 11.2 mils. And if I just compare that to the track width, you'll see here that the track width is only 4.1 mils. So these things are actually much farther apart than they are wide. The reason they're designed like this is so that we can hit a particular impedance target along this net. So we need to have a specific impedance in order for signals to route through here without experiencing excess reflection as they travel along this line and then up through these vias and then into the other components on the top layer. That is the main reason that we might put them somewhat close together. There are reasons to put them very close together, and there are reasons to put them a little bit farther apart, like I have here in this example. So this need to sometimes put the traces closer together in a differential pair is gonna bring us to our next myth about differential pair design. Now let's take a look at myth number two. Myth number two is actually related to myth number one. And myth number two says that differential pairs either always require ground or they don't require ground in order to function correctly. The truth is that sometimes you can put your traces in your differential pair close together when you don't have ground very close to the traces. This is one of the reasons why something like USB on our two layer module that I see here on screen will work correctly even though it's a two layer board. So let's take a look at the stack up of this board. If I go into the layer stack manager, you'll see that the thickness of the board is pretty thick. It's 62 mils total. There's a 59 mil distance between our two layers on the top and bottom. Now, if I go over to the impedance section, and I just take a look at the impedance profile that I've created here, you'll see here that it's 90 ohms when the trace gap is five mils. And then we have our width here of 9.4 mils. Now this is important because we actually have ground up on the top layer separated by a clearance of five mils. And so we can see that here in the PCB layout. So we've got a five mil clearance between these two traces, and then we have a polygon pour to trace clearance here that's set just slightly above this. Now, what would happen if instead of having the coplanar ground, 
we didn't have any ground on that top layer and we just had ground on the next layer. Well here you'll see that we require a 15.9 mil wide trace with that same 5 mil gap in order to hit our target impedance of 90 ohms. Now, if we were to not tightly couple the two traces in our pair, let's say we space these out by 20 mils, we would require really wide traces of 60 mils in order to hit this impedance target. So, this is why sometimes we want to have traces close together. It's when we have ground farther away from the two traces like we have in this example stack up. Now, if instead we were to bring ground close to our traces on the top layer, maybe we have a five mil outer layer thickness, you'll notice here that if I update this impedance profile, you'll see that I can now have a wider gap between my traces when I have ground nearby, and then I get a manageable trace width of 10 mils. So this should help you understand why myth number one and myth number two are interrelated. Myth number two arises from the fact that you can have a lack of ground around your traces when the traces are brought close together. However, when you have ground nearby the traces, you don't always need to have the two traces routed right next to each other with a very narrow distance. It all depends on what you're trying to accomplish in your particular board. Now, if we just zoom out on this board and then we put it into 3D, we can see here that, of course, we have a connector and we're routing differential pairs onto this connector. And then those differential pairs are going to go out onto a cable. So you might be asking, how exactly do we maintain differential impedance once those signals are routed out onto a cable? Well, the answer is that the cable has a specific impedance. So the cable that you plug into, for example, an Ethernet plug or this USB plug has a rate of impedance based on how the wiring is designed inside the cable. One good example is, of course, twisted pair. That's what you'll use in Ethernet. Another good example here on the Newark website is Twin-X cable. So this Twin-X cable is used in data centers, and this cable has an impedance of 100 ohms. So it's meant to be used specifically for copper interfaces that require a 100 ohm differential impedance. With each of the wires being designed to a specific impedance, that is how the signal can then get onto the cable without excess reflection, and then eventually get all the way down to the other end into a receiver. Now let's take a look at myth number three. Myth number three says that differential pairs do not create crosstalk and they can't receive crosstalk or they're immune to crosstalk. This is totally incorrect. Differential pairs can create crosstalk and they can create crosstalk into other differential pairs. And this is called differential crosstalk. And it's a topic I'll do another video on soon. They can also receive crosstalk from single-ended traces. So just to see where we might expect differential crosstalk to arise, let's take a look again at some of the interconnects in this FPGA board. So you see if I zoom in over here, we can see some of these interconnects here on this board can experience crosstalk with each other. And that is because, of course, they are routed in parallel with each other. So we have these long parallel sections here, and we don't have any real kind of shield in between them. Here, where we have some of the copper pore in between these on the same layer, we might expect a little bit better shielding, but of course, this is something that we would want to quantify in simulation. So in order to quantify the amount of differential crosstalk between these two groups of differential pairs, what we would want to do is use a simulator like Symbior. So here I have Symbior pulled up and I've already brought the project into Symbior and I'm getting it set up to calculate the S parameters for this four port network. So in order to do this, I just run a couple of commands and then it's going to spit out the S parameters for this interconnect. So now you can see all of these curves populate and we have several different S parameter curves on this return loss plot. So here what this is showing is differential port one to differential port one. So this is basically the reflection at differential port one and then so on for two, three and four. Now what I can do is I can convert these into differential crosstalk plots just by selecting a different matrix element from our S parameter matrix. Now here what I've done is I have set up near end and far end differential crosstalk curves as 
S parameters. So here what you can see is that we have really low crosstalk on these uh, differential pairs just by looking at these two curves. So here on the top half, you can see our regular return loss plots. And then on the bottom half is where we have our next and our fixed. So here, this green curve is our next or our near end differential crosstalk. And then here, this brown curve or orange curve is our far end differential crosstalk. Now, these curves illustrate really low values of differential crosstalk. Typically, you might expect to see these maybe closer to negative 50 dB or negative 60 dB or even higher, maybe negative 30 or negative 40 dB. One reason that we have such low differential crosstalk is because if we go back to the layer stack manager, you can see that for signal layer three, we have our ground pretty close to that signal layer. And we have ground, it's a little bit farther from the signal layer on L4, but it is still close enough that we get some pretty good noise suppression. Now to fully evaluate differential crosstalk, you would actually want to do this simulation as a 3D simulator. Here I just did the fast SI simulator, but it gives you a good estimate of the differential crosstalk in these interconnects. Myth number four, vias must always be eliminated from differential pairs, or if they are present, they should always be back drilled. This is also incorrect, and it can lead to over designing a differential pair. And specifically, it can lead to over designing the vias. Now, it is possible to design vias to have a desired differential impedance. So here inside of Symbior, what I can do is I can bring up one of these examples here, and you can actually see what the impedance of this via pair is based on the plane openings and any other nearby by ground vias. So this is just one of the vias that was extracted from that layout. Now about the issue of stubs, it is true that on very fast interfaces, stubs should be eliminated. That can be done through back drilling or it can be done by routing through blind and buried vias. Now, unless you have a really long stub, you're not going to be able to see the effects of that stub in an insertion loss plot until you get to very high frequencies. So an example is found right here in this blue curve. Here in this blue curve, you can see that there is a stub resonance here at about 27.3 gigahertz. So this is a very high frequency. If this digital channel were only operating on the order of, let's say, a few gigabits per second, we really wouldn't need to worry about this stub resonance. Instead, we would just want to focus on this this portion of the plot to ensure that the insertion loss curve is linear and low loss. And then we would want to focus on this region of the return loss curve to ensure that we're sufficiently far below negative 10 dB that this interface is going to function correctly. Same remarks apply to the crosstalk curves. Now about the vias, it is possible to design these vias so that they do have a 100 ohm differential impedance looking into this interconnect. Due to the size of these anti-pads, which are a little small, we're actually gonna have pretty significant losses in terms of return loss going into the 25 gigahertz range. However, if this differential via is only going to be on an interconnect that's operating at, let's say, a few gigahertz, then this differential via will probably be just fine, and you won't have to worry about getting this curve to be flat along 100 ohms all the way up to these very high frequencies. And finally, myth number five, differential pairs must always be perfectly length matched in order for the interface to function. This is also untrue only in that you don't need to have them perfectly length matched. They just need to delay match within some time window. So what that means is that when each of the signals on the two sides of the differential pair reach the receiver, they just need to cross over each other within some time window. And that time window is given by the rise time of the signals. Now let's take a look at how we do that. Typically, if we're on a PCB, you'll see these small length tuning sections placed near the inhomogeneity on these differential pairs. Now, you may ask, why wouldn't we want to pile up these very long length tuning sections on these single-ended DDR traces over here on these differential pairs? Well, the issue is that these very long sections create something called mode conversion. Mode conversion is a topic that I'll discuss in another video. But essentially what mode conversion does is it, is it converts common mode noise to differential mode noise 
and vice versa. And what that means is that your differential signal could get partially converted to common mode signal, and then the receiver will eliminate that portion of the power from the differential signal. Now we can also visualize mode conversion on an S parameter plot. So let's just go back over here to our quick simulation we did for some of these interconnects. So here what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the mode conversion coming out of the interconnect. So what I mean by that is the amount of common mode noise that I get out of this interconnect based on the amount of differential power that I put in. And if I just switch to that new matrix element, here you can see how much mode conversion we have on this interconnect. And this is actually a pretty good amount of mode conversion. We would like for this curve to be lower. The reason is that common mode noise is a common form of EMC failure, especially if that common mode current gets out onto a cable. This is one reason that you might see common mode chokes placed on cables. It is to eliminate that common mode noise, so that way it removes that source of radiation and helps you pass EMC testing. We can also look at the amount of common mode noise reflected from the input port of the differential pair. So to do that, I just right click, hit properties, and I can switch this to the other common mode port at our differential input. And then you can see here that we even have some common mode noise that gets reflected from the input of our differential pair. So this again is something we would like to get as low as possible. So again, we see that at very low frequencies, this interconnect will probably work just fine. We have very low common mode noise up to a few gigahertz, and we have very good impedance matching up to a few gigahertz. But once we get to higher frequencies around the seven gigahertz range, we see that we have pretty bad impedance matching, and we start to get some common mode noise at the input and output ports. Now, in general, if we have a longer length tuning section, such as what you're seeing here on this DDR4 trace, we would have these portions of the mode conversion spectrum moving to the left. So we would essentially expect more mode conversion at lower frequencies. This is the reason that we like to have our length tuning sections be shorter, looking something like this, and then placed very close to the region where the inhomogeneity arises. This helps keep mode conversion low, and it increases your chances of passing EMC, especially when your signals are operating at higher frequencies. Thanks for watching this video, everybody. Make sure to stay tuned for our videos on mode conversion and differential crosstalk. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, leave your comments and questions in the comments section. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.